Yeah, I, I, I share that. I think there's some common pathways that, that all these diseases share for the most part with, with rare exception. Yeah. You mentioned dementia, and, and that's something that I, I, I don't I think people understand the enormity of the problem and, and, and what's going to occur as we continue with this growing problem with metabolic disease, diabetes, so yeah. on and so forth. We're going to have an immense dementia population to deal with, which, I mean, it's tough when someone's in your family has dementia. You've got to deal with that. Now, either you stick them in a home, which is very expensive, or you, you take them under your wing, and then it's difficult for you to earn a living because you're constantly worrying about, if, is, is mom going to burn the house down or something like that? Yep. It's a very challenging thing. You said, uh, interesting, I, I saw that the FDA approved a, a recent drug for Alzheimer's, despite, I think, 12 out of 13 of their, their consultants saying it doesn't work or it may be harmful. It was a particularly egregious decision by the FDA, wasn't it? And the number of resignations, I used to think of the FDA as a tough regulator. It feels to me like the FDA have been completely captured by the pharma industry, um, I regret to say. You kind of want to rely on your regulators, don't you? And I think the same is true, but to a lesser extent to what we, to what we have here, which is nice, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, because they've approved the PCSK9 inhibitors on the basis of no evidence whatsoever. And even they admit there's no evidence it'll extend life, which is kind of the point. Yep. So I, it bothers me deeply that the FDA has been captured by Big Pharma because the FDA is a world leading organization that the whole of the world's health systems look, should be able to look up to. It's deeply, deeply disturbing, isn't it? Yeah, when we look at the funding for the FDA, I think something like 65% of their funding for drug approvals actually comes from pharmacy. It's called regulatory yeah. capture, and, and that it shouldn't exist. I mean, I think that should be a priority to say, look, we can't have regulators that are compromised or influenced. It doesn't serve the people they're supposed to be serving unless you say they're serving the pharmaceutical it, industries, which it looks it wouldn't like. Be accept no, you're so right, Sean. It, it wouldn't be accepted in any other walk of life, would it? There'll be declarations of interest, and people will be ruled out except in medicine for reasons that completely escape me, but I can see the consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, well, there's a lot of money to be made here. And so yeah. it's that, that sort of, you just look at that and we always hear follow the money and it makes sense. But yeah, yeah. what, where do you uh, see, uh, are you optimistic about what you're doing or are you thinking it's just going to get more and more of the same and we're just going to kind of see more and more sick people uh, on and on and on? Oops, I think. You might, sorry, someone just dialed in. Let me just oh, okay. reset that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, do you know what? I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because I see what a small group of people have done. And I'm optimistic because I meet people like you, the guys from Diet Doctor. And I'm optimistic because in the end, I think the science has to win. And I'm optimistic because I think that a group of us are creating a social movement for change. And I'm optimistic because despite everything, in the end, the cigarette industry didn't win. I don't think sugar will ultimately win, even though it's won for the last hundred years. And I have to believe, do I not, that there's, there's a better alternative because otherwise what's the point? And that's why I think a group of us nationally and internationally need to come together and support each other through these bad times. I mean, I, um, Tim Noakes is one of my heroes. And when you think, and I've had Gary Fetke on my podcast, all these guys who the system tried to annihilate because it didn't like the messages that was a threat to their business model, in the end, they win. And I do believe we'll win. The question is how many more unnecessary millions of deaths will, 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 will we tolerate before we win? You, you mentioned you think we need to reform or reframe the way we do healthcare. How does that look to you? What do you, what would you, what would, you know, if you were the sort of the health czar or the, yeah, uh, the, I'm not sure the top guy in the UK is called, uh, I, you know, the health minister. Yeah. Health minister. Yeah. If, how would yeah. that look to you? What so, would you do? I believe that the vast majority of health professionals in whatever system fundamentally, with a few bad exceptions, are altruistic at their heart. I think health professionals are fundamentally well motivated. And then they get perverted by the system and the paymasters. I also think the vast majority of us understand the fundamental underlying science. 
Um, and it wasn't, it's fairly recently I gave a talk to 120 GPs or family physicians. I was on, I did it was one where it was myself and David Unwin. There was another one when uh, myself and Asim Malhotra, who I'm sure you also know. Yep. Yeah, no, Asim. I can tell you something. Health professionals are very, very bright people. And once they, once that, once they see the light and once they see a, a couple of examples in, in front of them, they, the change isn't slow, it's rapid. And I believe that we can lobby and we can get health professionals on board and I'm seeing it. It's, you know, if you went back, what, 20 years, keto, people who practice keto, and I'm not particularly a keto practitioner, but ketos were, were regarded as complete nutters, weren't they? I mean, just maniacs. And now I know in the States, the most Googled diet is keto diet. So it's changing, it's changing quite rapidly. And I believe that we're at a pivot point. And I think in the next 10 years, two fundamental things will reshape the practice of medicine. One is the un growing understand of the role, understanding of the role of the microbiome. And the other one is the understanding of insulin, insulin resistance, and that kind of playoff between insulin and glucagon and how that drives metabolic syndrome. So I, I genuinely think we're at a pivot point and God knows we have to be because if we don't, the entire world will be diabetic and all health systems will be bust. Yeah, let's, when we talk, because we have, uh, I mean, we have a, a very myopic uh, view of health and it, it always sort of pains me when uh, I tell people I had a bunch of steak and the first question is, what's your cholesterol? And I, I think that's the yeah. right question. What, that's not even the right question. Absolutely. You know, I, I would say, what's my what's my heart health like? And that, I think that's a better better question to ask. But yeah, how do we, I mean, can we frame some better targets perhaps? I mean, how, I mean, if we're like, what should we, what should we be looking at? Should we do waist to height ratios? We, I mean, I, I have my thoughts on what, what would be good to target. Yeah. What are, I'm interested to hear what yours are. Yeah, so I, I, I'd even take it, even more of a helicopter view than that, Sean. Um, I'm 62, right? My kids are now having children. What's my objective? I want to be able to do everything with my grandchildren that I could do with my children. And I want to have an absolutely full and healthy life. I'm in a, a stage of life where I'm still working very hard, but I, you know, I'm no longer struggling just, just to survive and make ends meet. And, you know, I'm in a very happy relationship and I want to have a really full life. And that includes a full on sex life. Now, you know, when you're in your 20s, you don't think people in their 60s have sex. And when you get to 60, you probably assume that people in their 90s don't have sex. Um, and I think it's under discussed and I'm very happy to talk about it because actually it's part and parcel of life. And if and if a man is incapable of sustaining an, an erection, that tells you an awful lot about their cardiovascular health. So to me, it's about full on functionality and to die young at a very old age and to have, a, you know, to, to basically die in your sleep of nothing very much like they do in the blue zones. So that I would describe it in terms of functionality. Right. Then you get into the metrics, which is kind of behind your real question. For example, does blood pressure go up with age? No, doesn't have to. Why does it go up with age? Because we insult our cardiovascular system. What are the meaningful metrics? Well, you know, if you said in, a, in the length of a tweet, what's the one thing you should do to, to maximize your healthy life expectancy? It would, my answer would be secrete the minimum amount of insulin. But we don't measure insulin, do we? we? Generally speaking, we measure blood glucose, but we don't measure insulin. So there's some really basic and, and relatively cheap measures that we could get involved in. One is coronary artery calcium which shows you, gives you a really good idea of what the state of your cardiovascular system is. Another one is a simple ratio between your HDL and cholesterol and your triglycerides. And the third one is HOMER IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance. And if we measured those metrics instead of other surrogate markers, then we could intervene in those people who really need it and not all those other people who don't. 